Welcome to the Life Diagnostic Webinar Series. And this particular webinar is on therapeutic drug monitoring of antifungals. Today we're going to go over the basic principles of why we need to do therapeutic drug monitoring and which methods are available. We'll then deal with the particular drugs for which this is most appropriate, particularly itraconazole and voriconazole amongst the azoles, and then separately flucytosine. So our learning objectives today are to understand the need for TDM when prescribing itraconazole, voriconazole or flucytosine, to be familiar with their main indications, the formulations and the relevance of those for TDM dosages and key pharmacokinetics. It's also important to be familiar with the side effects and whether they're related to drug levels and what dose adjustments are recommended in patients who have high or low levels. And we'll also summarize and show you some full details of TDM methodologies, in particular a mass spectrometry measurement, but there are other methods which we won't show you in detail, but we'll discuss briefly. So there are many antifungals on the market. The last licensed antifungal in Europe and the States was Isabuconazole. And the drugs we're going to talk about today, flucytosine, was developed in the 1970s. Itraconazole approved in the early 1990s and Voriconazole in 2002. So what are the main arguments for undertaking a therapeutic drug monitoring? The first is that there are important drug interactions which affect the bioavailability or metabolism of antifungals, and this is one of the ways of checking on that, particularly proton pump inhibitors and itraconazole absorption and rifampicin or rifampin, which increases azole metabolism, resulting in undetectable levels. There are multiple other drugs that can do this, including antiepileptics. In some patients, particularly in those on long-term therapy, the compliance with therapy is not great, and this is a means of checking whether patients are taking the medicine that is prescribed, and in particular, the dose that's prescribed. Severe disease may require higher levels of drug, and there's also a lot of pharmacokinetic variability in children and the elderly, and probably in obese patients, although this is less well studied overall. There's certainly variability in patients who are critically ill and those who have organ failure. And there are certain genetic polymorphisms which increase or reduce the metabolism of drugs, and notably with oroconazole. So there are three broad approaches to measuring drug levels in plasma or serum. The first is a bioassay methodology, and this is cheap and simple to run, although you do have to have the relevant bioassay organisms and create the standard curve of the drug of interest. If you have dual antifungal therapy, then the other antifungal can interfere with results, but this is not true for amphotericin, which diffuses poorly in agar. And with respect to itraconazole, which is often measured by bioassay, both the native itraconazole and its primary metabolite, hydroxy itraconazole, are bioactive and can diffuse through the agar at different rates, producing effectively a dual result. And therefore, you get different results of bioassay than you do with HPLC or mass spec for itraconazole. HPLC is widely available. Many drugs are measured this way, and it can detect multiple drugs in a single sample if it's set up appropriately. And here you can measure it to separately from the metabolite, for example. Mass spectrometry is a more expensive machine, and overall, therefore, it's a slightly more expensive method. But it can also detect multiple drugs in a single sample, and it's very sensitive and specific and is the method of choice if there are a large number of samples coming through. The preparation for mass spec is also simpler than it is for HPLC. So let me take you through the different azoles, in particular itraconazole first. So this is a second generation azole, it's a synthetic triazole. Uh, the molecular weight is on the high side for most drugs, at 700, and it's structurally fairly similar to ketoconazole and quite similar to posaconazole. And this produces some common features in, with regard to its metabolism, although not all of them. The main indications for itraconazole are dermatological, including oral or esophageal candidiasis, particularly using the solution rather than capsules. Vulvovaginal candidiasis, pityriasis versicolor, 
tinea corporis or cruris, pedis and manuum. The indication for retroconazole is increasing because of tibinophene resistance, onychomycosis, and various forms of aspergillosis, both chronic and allergic aspergillosis. For other systemic infections, it's indicated for histoplasmosis and coccidiodomycosis. It has a license for systemic candidiasis, although it's infrequently used for that, although itraconazole is active against most species of candida. And it's also used for cryptococcosis in some patients as primary prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis, particularly if patients are at risk of another infection such as histoplasmosis or have a dual or triple infection. The therapeutic drug ranges that are recommended for nitroconazole with HPLC levels are zero point, more than 0.5 and more than 1 if you have a systemic infection. And a toxic level is not clearly defined with a single value, but gradually increases as the levels go up. It inhibits 3A4 metabolism and therefore has quite a lot of drug interactions, and these should be checked before prescribing. The absorption is variable with triconazole, with quite poor absorption in patients with mucositis and advanced HIV disease, and those on PPIs if capsules are taken. It's also better absorbed with food, and if patients aren't eating, then that can be a problem. The bioavailability of the capsule is about 55%, but it's higher with the oral solution at 80%. There's an important food effect and gastric acid effect with the capsules, but not with the oral solution. It doesn't get into the spinal fluid, although it has been used for treating some brain infections, but it's not the preferred agent. It has a very high protein binding, principally metabolized by the liver through CYP3A4 to, in part, hydroxyitraconazole, which also has some activity and is slightly more water-soluble than itraconazole itself. With lower doses, its half-life is 21 hours, but it's got a longer half-life with higher doses. And its excretion is through the urine and feces through its metabolites. If you look at its other key PK parameters, as I mentioned, it's got low solubility and the absorption varies a lot from patient to patient. And it's got this important food effect with the capsules, but not the uh, solution. And this half-life varies depending on the dose. The important side effects of itraconazole include nausea, vomiting, taste disturbance, abdominal pain and diarrhea, and the vomiting and diarrhea particularly problem with the oral solution and, and much less of a problem with capsules. It can cause a hepatitis and hepatotoxicity, although this is infrequent. In patients on long-term therapy, peripheral neuropathy is a problem and some patients get headaches or feel dizzy. It can cause congestive cardiac failure and ankle swelling. It also can cause hypokalemia. Rarely it can cause a rash. So the arguments for itraconazole TDM were mostly conducted with respect to prophylaxis in patients with neutropenia, leukemia, and the capsules were not very well absorbed in these patients. And levels that were low, that is less than 0.5 by HPLC, were associated with a much higher mortality than those with a higher level. And when you look at that overall, because of the difficulties of absorption, only the solution had a significant impact on reducing the incidence of facial aspergillosis. In work we published many years ago, we looked at the patients with different levels and their rate of toxicity of all sorts, including not being able to sleep and headache and so on, and, and, more, and more serious toxicities. And those patients who had levels by bioassay of more than 17 had really quite a marked increased incidence of adverse events. So one of the other arguments for measuring a console is to try to minimise these adverse events. So the recommended bioassay range is between 5 and 17, and by HPLC it's 1 to 3, and mass spec would be the same as the HPLC measurement. Because the half-life is long, levels can be measured at any point after steady state is reached through the day. There isn't a need to specifically measure trough or peak levels. If the level is above the range, then depending on how high it is, the total daily dose should be reduced by 100 or 200 milligrams a day. And it can take some days for that change of dose to appear in terms of blood level monitoring. If the level is below range, then compliance and drug interactions need to be checked in detail. The dose can be increased. If there are proton pump inhibitors or ranitidine, cimetidine, then those should be stopped 
It's also possible to administer capsules with food or curd or other acidic beverages because that increases absorption. And a switch from capsules to liquid can also solve the problem of low blood levels. The other azol that it's important to monitor and measure for TDM purposes is voriconazole. The molecular structure of voriconazole is fairly similar to that of fluconazole, but it behaves quite differently from fluconazole, as fluconazole is mostly water-soluble and excreted in the urine, whereas voriconazole is metabolized by the liver. Like itraconazole, is on the WHO essential medicines list and is a very important drug for the treatment of invasive and chronic pulmonary tuberculosis. The drug comes as tablets, typically 50 or 200 milligram strength, but it can also come as a suspension for oral use, and it is also intravenous through powder. And there are some generic formulations available, although the original product used by Pfizer. The therapeutic range is recommended to be between 1 and 5.5, and toxic levels with a higher rate of hepatic and neurotoxicity are associated with levels above 6. The enzyme systems that it particularly goes through are 2C9 and 3A4, but there's also a polymorphism with 2C19. It has non-linear kinetics in adults and linear kinetics in children. The oral availability of voriconazole is high at more than 90%, and it's not affected by gastric acidity, but it is recommended that medication is taken an hour before food for increased and maximum absorption. It's 58% protein bound. It gets into the spinal fluid to some extent, but certainly into the CSF and ocular compartments. And that it means that it is typically the drug of choice for CNS disease. To get high levels in the blood, a loading dose is recommended, particularly when intravenous therapy is recommended. The half-life varies a lot depending on the patient's metabolic state, but is typically 6 to 24 hours and therefore twice daily dosing is the norm for a voriconazole. Very little active drug is excreted in the urine. So it's metabolized through the 2C9, 2C19 and 3A4 systems, and in particular 2C19 is an important genetic metabolizer, and some patients are slow metabolizers and others are fast metabolizers. So in addition, patients who have cirrhosis or have drunk too much alcohol may be slow metabolizers of this drug, and very old people are also slow metabolizers of the drug. 3 to 5% of Caucasians and 15 to 20% of Asians, particularly Northeast Asians, that is from Korea and Japan and China, have genetic polymorphisms of the 2C19 and are slow metabolizers and may develop toxicity early in the course of therapy. You can see here an example of modelling of the levels in patients who are fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers, and there's really a very large difference in exposure, and this is the point of the genetic polymorphism. In addition, we also see a lot of variability from one patient to another, and these models just illustrate that. So some patients have really quite low levels and others have higher levels. Aspergillus is inhibited, it's a time over MIC drug, and so having enough oriconazole to inhibit the organism on a continuous basis is important for continuous therapy. And you can see that some of the patients who are fast metabolizers don't achieve this through the 24 hour period. Patients who have levels above six tend to have toxicity, and those levels one or two have higher rate of clinical failure. So certain elements of the diet impact levels, so high-fat meals reduce absorption. We recommend voriconazole taken before or after a meal and not around the time of the meal, and gastric pH is not important. So several studies show a correlation between levels and outcome. In one prospective randomized study, which is an unusual design, patients who had the levels reported to the clinicians versus those who didn't have the levels reported to clinicians were more likely to stay on drug, and there were many fewer discontinuations in that group of patients. And the response rate was also higher in those who had TDM. And that's really because this is a very effective drug. And if there's uncertainty about whether patients are able to tolerate it or whether they're having enough drug, and a switch is made to an inferior drug, such as for aspergillosis anyway, kinicandins or amphotericin, this impacts on outcome.
The most important side effects are nausea and vomiting, although they're not that common overall. Liver function test abnormalities do occur, particularly with high levels. Abnormal vision seen as a flashing light or some other odd visual sensations are common, and some patients have photophobia and or colour vision changes. Over time, fair-skinned white people can get photosensitivity or photodermatitis and dry lips and dry eyes, and that can be quite a problem. If patients are immunocompromised, it can increase the rate of skin cancer. Rare events include problems which can occur with almost any drug, including a Stevens-Johnson syndrome or cholestasis or liver failure. So here's an example of the impact of blood levels and neurotoxicity, which is manifest primarily as confusional states or very severe visual disturbances. And you can see that patients who had levels above six were much more likely to have neurological toxicity than those who did not. And if you also look at liver toxicity, there's a gradual increase in the proportion of patients with toxicity in those as the levels arise. So both of these are arguments for keeping the drug in the therapeutic range. So we also know that the outcomes are better in patients who have trough levels more than one. Because this is a twice a day drug, it's important to measure trough levels if it's possible to do so. And trough levels more than six are associated with encephalopathy, confusion, hepatotoxicity, visual disturbance, cardiac and electrolyte side effects. So who actually should have oroconazole TDM? So for prophylaxis, for which it doesn't have an indication, levels should be more than one. And we normally recommend a trough concentration should be measured within the first seven days after initiation of therapy. It's important to try to re-monitor varicosal levels if other drugs are stopped, particularly those that interact substantially. Some patients don't take the therapy very well, and then there are also concerns about GI absorption in some patients and potential laboratory or clinical manifestations, so patients with confusion or liver abnormalities, to ascertain whether those are due to the drug or some other problem. It helps with whether to stop the drug permanently or temporarily. So the level should be more than one to maximize efficacy. And if patients have very severe infections, particularly CNS infections, then more than two. And try and keep the trough level less than 5.5 to minimize toxicity. If the level is above the range, then the general recommendation is to reduce the dose by 50%. If the levels are very high, that is more than 10, then consider an alternative antifungal or skip one dose and then reduce by 50%. If the levels are below the range, then obviously compliance and interaction should be checked and the dose should be increased up by 50%, so 50 or 100 milligrams twice daily if the patient's on oral. So a common change of dose is from 200 milligrams twice daily to 250 milligrams twice daily. If the patient's on a very high dose, 350 milligrams twice daily or more, then increasing the dose usually ends up with neurological toxicity, which can be motor or sensory. The dose should be also checked in the five days of a change in dosage because that's important to get the dose right, given that the drug is not linear in adults. Now I'm going to move to the other azoles and introduce the LCMS assay, etc. Posaconazole suspension is not associated with adequate absorption in some patients. It's advised to give this with a fatty meal, and therefore it has been of value to measure posaconazole levels in patients on the suspension. There's very little data on high levels of posaconazole and toxicity, but our own experience suggests that patients with levels above three are more likely to get some side effects. The posaconazole tablets are better absorbed than suspension and therefore there is much less concern about low levels, although even in some children and some stem cell transplant patients there may be low levels in occasional patients. But it may be possible to reduce the dose if TDM is done and the patients have adequate levels. There's no guidance at the moment about isabiconazole level and TDM. So now we're going to introduce and show you a video regarding an LCMS assay for measuring all azole levels in the same assay. This has been published and it is quite a useful technique for labs with the relevant capabilities. The combined azole assay measures the level of the antifungal agents voriconazole 
posiconazole, itraconazole, and hydroxyitraconazole in patient plasma samples by liquid chromatography tandem mass spectroscopy. The analysis is undertaken to determine azole levels in patients receiving the drugs for treatment or prophylaxis of fungal disease. The results are highly specific and are not influenced by the use of antifungal combination therapy. This procedure is carried out in polypropylene 96 deep well plates. Polystyrene or polycarbonate plates must not be used. Timings are non-critical and will not affect examination results. Before you begin, ensure the daily mass spectrometer maintenance has been carried out on the mass spectrometer to be used. Collect your quality controls and standards from the fridge or freezer and print out a worksheet from your data capture system. External standards and quality control material can be purchased commercially and made up according to the manufacturer's instructions. Internal standards of D3-voriconazole, D5-posiconazole and D5-itraconazole should be made up to 1 mg per milliliter in methanol. These are stable for five years in the freezer and can be diluted to create working internal standards as required. Inclusion of these standards mitigates against any matrix effects that might alter the ionization efficiency and adversely affect accuracy and sensitivity. A working combined azole internal standard D3 voriconazole at 0.2 mg per litre is made by diluting stock D3 voriconazole 1 in 5000 in methanol. 1 mg per litre of D5 posiconazole and D5 itraconazole are made by diluting the relevant stock solutions 1 in 1000 in methanol. D5 posiconazole is used as the internal standard for hydroxyitraconazole. Working internal standards can be stored in the fridge and are stable for 12 months. To start the assay, label the plate. Follow the printed workout sheet. Write the well number to be used on the worksheet starting with the standards, followed by the quality controls and finally the patient samples. Vortex mix the standards and quality controls. Invert the patient samples and pipette 25 microliters of each into the appropriate well. A 25 microliter positive displacement pipette should be used for maximum accuracy and the tip should be changed daily. The pipette tip must be washed between samples with deionized water, then methanol, then fresh deionized water. Using a repeat pipette and appropriate tip, add 25 microliters of 0.1 millimoles per litre zinc sulfate solution to each well to precipitate proteins. followed by 100 microliters of combined azole working internal standard for further protein precipitation. Seal the plate with heat sealed foil. And rub over the surface to ensure that the seal is complete. Vortex mix for one minute on a multi vortex, then centrifuge the plate at 2500 RPM for five minutes. Place the samples in the auto sampler of the liquid chromatography unit, ensuring that the correct mobile phases are loaded. Mobile phase A1 is made up of 2 millimoles per litre of ammonium acetate with 0.1% formic acid by volume in deionized water. Similarly, mobile phase B1 is made up of 2 millimoles per litre of ammonium acetate with 0.1% formic acid by volume in methanol. Put the azole column 
in this case, a Phenomenex Kinetex 2.6 micron C8 column, 30 by 2.1 millimeter with crud catcher guard, inside the oven and set to 40 degrees C. Load the correct Azol's tune page on the mass spectrometer. The mass to charge ratio transitions used to measure voriconazole and D3 voriconazole are approximately 350 to 224 and 353 to 224 respectively. The mass to charge ratio transitions used to measure posiconazole and D5 posiconazole are approximately 701 to 127 and 706 to 127 respectively. The mass to charge ratio transitions used to measure itraconazole and D5 itraconazole are approximately 705 to 392 and 710 to 397 respectively. The transitions used to measure hydroxy itraconazole is approximately 721 to 408. D5 posiconazole is used as the internal standard for hydroxy itraconazole. The run can be analysed and reported against the internal standards. After the run, post-analytical checks should be done by a senior laboratory scientist. The quality control values should be recorded to check that the run has passed and equipment maintenance records should be kept. This is best practice for column and assay care and should include back pressure on the UPLC, area for the top standard and retention time. Once these checks are complete, the data can be entered into your hospital system to be reviewed by clinicians. So now I'm going to address flucytosine. Flucytosine is a synthetic fluorinated analogue of one of the DNA bases, cytosine. And you can see the structure here with the very subtle difference between the base and the drug. The molecular weight is quite small. The bruminate is critical for DNA and RNA and other nucleotides. It was originally discovered as an anti-cancer drug and in high concentrations does have bone marrow toxicity. It's the only anti-metabolite systemic antifungal in clinical practice. Flucytosine is indicated in particular for cryptococcal meningitis in combination with amphotericin or flucytosine. It can also be used in severe systemic candidiasis in combination with amphotericin. And with the emergence of multi-resistant candida auris and candida vibrata infections, this is relevant. It's excreted in the urine, and so some people have used it for urogenital candidiasis, particularly with glabrata infections, which are fluconazole resistant. And there's an off-label indication for chromoblastomycosis and a few other rare infections. Most of the prescribing is oral through capsules or tablets, and there are a small number of generic manufacturers of flucytosine. Some countries have parenteral flucytosine and others do not. The dose is the same, but it's in, given obviously in a different mood. So the standard dose now for cryptococcal meningitis is 100 milligrams per kilogram per day in four divided doses. Flucytosine has a short half-life and so it needs to be given frequently and this does cause difficulties, uh, particularly in the outpatient setting. The older text suggested a dose between 50 and 150 milligrams per kilogram per day, but these higher levels are not necessary in cryptococcal meningitis. In children, the doses are the same, unless you're a neonate, in which case slightly higher doses are required, and it's cleared fairly fast by babies, unless they're very premature indeed. Now, if a patient has renal dysfunction, it's very important to adjust the dose because the drug is almost completely excreted through the urine. And so there is a nomogram for this in terms of the creatinine clearance. This has been developed well in adults, but not so well in children. And so although the individual doses are the same at 25 milligrams per kilogram per dose, the dosage interval should change so that patients get much less frequent dosing. So if you have somebody in overt renal failure, then it would be given probably once every two to three days, and it'd be best to measure levels in those patients. Thucycine is associated with quite a lot of nausea and vomiting and some diarrhea and abdominal pain. It can cause rashes, although that's not too common. And much less commonly are a whole load of other side effects. Some of these are probably attributable to the very sick patients in whom it's given. And the particular concerns that we have are thrombocytopenia, leukopenia and aplastic anemia because of high levels of flucytosine. And that is exaggerated if you have renal dysfunction. 
and that may be exaggerated because patients are on amphotericin B. But flucytine can also cause hepatitis and hepatic necrosis, and that's important. And some patients do have a sense of CNS toxicity, again, probably related to higher doses in most of them. So the indications for flucytine TDM are really renal failure and renal impairment in neonates, patients on renal support, which can include hemofiltration or dialysis, patients on ECMO or other filters. There are occasional patients with very short bowels and maybe on long-term tofoprenchial condition and absorption may be an issue in those patients. And in patients who are taking flucytine for long periods of time with a chronic infection, it's important or helpful to check that they have the appropriate oral dose. The reason for measuring flucytine is because it has a relatively narrow therapeutic index and the idea is to keep levels under 100 because above that you get liver toxicity and bone marrow suppression in occasional patients. And if you have levels that are too low, then there's a greater chance of resistance emergence. And as monotherapy, this drug does induce resistance in Canada quite fast. So our plasma concentrations for optimal response are between 20 and 50 trough levels. The recommendation is between 70 to 80 peak and 30 to 40 trough. Similar levels in neonates, but slightly different levels. This is not well evidenced in terms of the precision of these levels, but it gives you a sense of what one is aiming for. And what we do know is that patients with high levels have more toxicity. So you can see this on the schematic here, where your peak levels should be between 50 and 100 and your trough between 20 and 40, and really trying to avoid levels above 100 or levels lower than 20. This was assessed in one study in the UK, and you can see on this graph here that there were really there was really a lot of variation. So only 21% were actually in the normal range, 41% had low levels, 5% undetectable levels, and nearly 40% had high levels. And neonates in particular had high levels more frequently than non-neonates. So flucytine can be measured in multiple different ways. This photograph shows you an example of a bioassay plate being set up, and that's a common means of measuring flucytine. HPLC is also fairly common. There are other methods, including a GLC, fluorometry and the enzymatic methods and these depend on what's available in your country or in your biochemistry laboratory. Here's an example of a flucytine bioassay plate and the size of the zone represents the amount of drug that's diffusing through the plate. It's not set up in a way that you can determine the level without measuring each individual zone, plotting a normal curve, and then taking the individual patient samples, which are more obvious because this precipitation of the serum around them with a sort of big white circle around the agar hole. Different bioassay organisms are used, and some of these can be resistant to other antifungals, so if, for example, a patient's on flucytine and fluconazole, then the choice of organism would be a fluconazole-resistant candida isolate, and then you could measure just the flucytosine, for example. Once the assay is set up, it's incubated overnight and then read the following morning, and the dynamic range of a flucytine bioassay is between 12 and 200. So the British Society for Medical Mycology recommended some reasons for measuring flucytosine. Now these are in this table here, and I've gone over these already. One of the key findings from the multiple very large studies that have been done in mostly in Africa, but also Southeast Asia, of cryptococcal meningitis with flucytosine indicate that levels are not necessary to be measured in these patients on a routine basis because at the slightly lower dose of 100 milligrams per kilogram per day, toxicity is infrequent. The only real exception to that is patients with significant renal failure, and some of these were excluded from the trials. So that's the group that may benefit from TDM. So in summary, itraconazole with HPLC, we're aiming for a level between 1 and 3, and with bioassay between 5 and 17. Capsules may have poor bioavailability and there may be variations between one generic preparation and another and factors affecting stomach acid like PPIs or lithium cimetidine also can impair absorption. Trough levels of less than 0.5 by HPLC are associated with a high mortality or clinical failure.
With voriconazole, the target trough level should be between 1 and 2, and more than 2 for severe infections. It has non-linear kinetics in adults, and there are slow metabolizers who have much greater exposure because they're a slow metabolizer. TDM also gives better responses and fewer discontinuations of therapy, and levels more than 5.5 are associated with neurotoxicity and hepatotoxicity. So with voriconazole, it's important to measure levels early in the course of therapy, and particularly from changing from IV to oral or with a change in dose. The target trough level for flucytosine is between 20 and 40, and levels above 100 should be avoided. The dose should be adjusted for renal impairment anyway, and TDM is recommended for patients with renal failure, neonates, dialysis, and those on various other forms of renal or other support, such as ECMO, in patients with short bowel syndrome and those with long-term use. Uh, so, David, um, a question that we're often asked, and sometimes we have to discuss this with the, the clinicians, what are the indications for amphotericin B TDM? Are there any? So, amphotericin B is a, has complicated pharmacodynamics. It has quite a short uh, serum half-life and then a second uh, redistribution phase and then probably a third complicated redistribution phase. And measuring the amount of drug in the blood uh, doesn't really help you because of these issues with redistribution. Uh, also, the liposomal or lipid-associated amphotericins have a different phase in that first initial redistribution phase from uh, blood. So you can get very high levels of drug in the blood initially, which then reduces, and that is not related, as far as we can tell, to efficacy. There have been a couple of autopsy studies which have uh, looked many, many years ago before the advent of the azoles and the echinocandins at tissue concentrations and whether you could grow a fungus in that same tissue, particularly in the liver, and there wasn't a strong relationship between those uh, two factors. So even if you have amphotericin in a tissue, that doesn't mean to say that the fungus is killed or not killed. So it's quite a complicated arrangement, and therefore there's really no indication uh, at all for measuring amphotericin B except for a pharmacokinetic study. Okay, thanks. So you mentioned the echinocandins in passing. Yeah. Are there any indications at all for measuring, for example, Casper fungin levels in, in serum? There's a good reliability uh, when you give an IV echinocandin for all three of the drugs, that there is some variation around 20% from person to person. <clears throat> and there's some indications that uh, patients who are very overweight or obese require higher doses of these drugs. But in terms of the relationship between a slightly higher or a slightly lower echinocandin and outcome, that there are none that have been found to date. And that's also partly probably because the drug is redistributed from serum uh, into tissue with active uptake into tissues as well. To my knowledge, there are no indications for measuring echinocandins. Okay, now a question from one of the attendees. Uh, you mentioned measuring uh, flucytosin levels in prolonged treatment. Would you measure on 14 days? Well, I think, I mean, would you measure after 14 days of oral treatment? Yes, I think there are broadly two reasons for measuring. The first is that particularly if the drug, if it, flucytosine is given with amphotericin, is that you often have changing renal function. So early in the course, the flucytosine levels can be in the therapeutic range. And then as renal function deteriorates with amphotericin, so the levels rise. If the drug is not used with amphotericin, then the reasons for measuring uh, levels are to check that you have the right dosage. And if you do intend to use it for a long time, it's helpful to know that you have enough drug, but also not too high a concentration of drug. You can also use measurement as a way of checking that the patient's actually taking the drug, if you so wish. Okay, thank you. Um, a comment actually which arose from one of our patient meetings, and really it's a message for prescribing doctors. When stopping antifungal treatment, please remember to check whether the other medications that the patients might be on had been adjusted, and if so, please, for the doctor request, change the, uh, the, the drug, the dosage of that other drug back to where it was once the antifungal treatment had been stopped.
Yeah, so the classic example of that was uh, described in several, uh, usually case reports or small series, with itraconazole and uh, cyclosporin. When itraconazole was given, the uh, there's an interaction between cyclosporin and itraconazole, so cyclosporin levels are substantially elevated to two to three times where they were before, which in the old days would save money because cyclosporin was very expensive, but also gave toxicity. And then after a course of therapy, which might be two weeks, six months, a year, in the patient still on cyclosporin, you stop itraconazole, that interaction then goes away, and then the patient may end up with too low a concentration of cyclosporin and rejection. And so it's important to evaluate cyclosporin levels at weekly intervals when an, a nasal antifungal is stopped um, because it will need a dose increase at some point, usually at two to three weeks after stopping the drug with itraconazole and earlier after boriconazole. Maybe a look into the future, but uh, do you see a role for pharmacogenetics in treating chronic fungal infection? You know, example, treating um, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis or allergic to bronchial pulmonary aspergillosis patients, testing those patients for CYP2C19 as part of their treatment, see whether or not, and this is something you did allude to, they are fast or slow metabolizers, or can you tell from their, their ethnicity whether they're going to be fast or slow metabolizers? So this particularly pertains to voriconazole and the slow metabolizer phenotype, which is a 2C19 phenotype, is found particularly in people from Northeast Asia, uh, in Korea and Japan and probably China. And it's present in around 15% of those individuals. If you take people from other parts of the world, the rates are around 3%. So they're quite, quite low rates. So Yes, if you were going to use Voriconazole, it would be possible to measure that uh, 2C19 SNP and work out what dose to use. However, you can also infer that by measuring the actual drug. So if you have a patient and you start them on treatment uh, and they have high levels early on, then they probably have a slow phenotype, a slow metabolizer phenotype. There may be a fast metabolizer phenotype as well, but that's well not as well described in the literature. I've also seen a very small number of patients who have a very slow metabolizer phenotype with itraconazole and need very little drug to maintain adequate levels, but it seems to be quite uncommon. Would I substitute drug level measurement for the pharmacogenomics? Probably not, because it would take longer to do the pharmacogenomics uh, assays, and most clinical labs don't offer them. But if, you, if it's available, then it would be a helpful thing to do, particularly in patients who might need voriconazole, particularly at the beginning of a leukemia treatment or transplant uh, therapy. Okay, so that um, introduces quite nicely the whole topic of availability. So most of our experience, if you like, in the Western world is based on, on um, mass spectrometry. I think to remember a few years ago, there was a paper on the development of an enzymatic uh, ELISA-based system for boriconazole, and I am aware of the fact that there are quite a few ELISA systems for other therapeutic agents. Where are we with um, with antifungals. Anything more to report about the uh, development of ELISA methods for antifungal TDM? I know of only one, and that's a voriconazole uh, ELISA method with a small uh, company in the US called ARC. And I think there's one paper published about it, and it had a good correlation with uh, other standard methods of measuring the drug. The limitation is trying to produce an antibody to the drug, which has got enough avidity and is reliable. And that has been why it has been difficult. And it is difficult to generate antibodies to itraconazole and voriconazole and posiconazole. But they, this company are clearly have achieved that, which is good. And that is an alternative way of, of approaching the problem, yes. Okay, a very, a very broad question. How accurate do you need to be when timing the trough measurements, taking a, a sample for a trough measurement? So for itraconazole, posaconazole, and uh, if you want to measure isabriconazole, it doesn't matter at all. 
uh, because they have a very long half-life, these drugs. And so you need to take a, a, a random level at about 7 to 14 days into therapy and check at that stage. Uh, you can you, if you have if you give a loading dose, then you can check earlier. With voriconazole, it's desirable to do a trough level, and it's very important with flucytosine to do a trough level. With voriconazole, because a lot of patients are treated in the outpatients, we tend to take random levels and then make a sort of mental adjustment as to whether it's likely to be high or low based on that. But it is not as effective and not as accurate as doing a trough level. So if you have a patient who's critically ill in the hospital, then it, it is very important to do a, a trough level because that will give you an accurate indication of where, whether you're underdosing or overdosing. Thank you. Right. So finally, I think um, just one more question. Uh, this is my own question. Stability of the analyte, stability of the antifungal drug in the clinical sample. So thinking of a situation where there's only one laboratory in one particular country offering this sort of service, um, how stable are these drugs in a clinical specimen? Thinking of the transit time and so on and ambient temperature and all of those factors, are, are these drugs particularly labile in clinical samples? They're, they're pretty stable molecules. So my expectation would be that there would be very little variation uh, over the course of two to three days in a clinical sample at a, a sort of what I would call a standard ambient temperature. I think if they were being transported in um, uh, in Saudi Arabia or across Death Valley in California at 50 degrees C for several days, I think that might not produce the right answer. But to be honest, that hasn't been studied carefully. Um, and I still would expect most of these drugs to be relatively stable for a, a, a small number of days. Uh, they're certainly stable at, uh, in the fridge for some period of time. Thank you very much for your attention. There are various other resources that you can access, including on the LIFE website and YouTube, multiple other videos which would maybe be helpful to you, and also a microscopy course that may be valuable for you. Many thanks.